Well, good evening. It's good to be on tonight. Don't see anybody on just yet, but uh, here we are at like a minute till seven, so I think it's uh, it's time to get started. Uh, I'm going to do a couple of announcements about things going on at church as I get started tonight, and I want you all, as you come on, uh, I, I want, uh, I see Nancy Hart is watching. Hi, Nancy. Uh, I want everybody tonight to be ready to make some comments. Hi, Dan Young over at Pikeville. Um, so um, you do that by using the comments. Tommy Sutherland just checked in with us. It's kind of funny. Um, um, before I, I get into my announcements, I want to make sure you all know Becky's on with me. She's going to slip around behind me tonight and... <laughs> Go away. Go sit down. I have a chair for her over here in the corner. I need to get her sitting down, Donna. Hi, Nikki Lockerbie. Good to see you, or at least to see that you're on. Uh, it's kind of funny. I decided to try uh, something. Uh, I guess that was yesterday. I would uh, brought a tripod home from church because I did a couple of videos for their uh, summer Bible challenge, and, and I used my, my iPhone to do those, and I actually like the video quality better on my iPhone, so I thought I'll, I'll try that with the Facebook Live Bible Study. So I took the tripod, set up my iPhone yesterday, and instead of trying it out on the Christ Church website going live, I did it on my personal Facebook Live, and I thought I'll just do this. I'll see if the video works or if I'm turned uh, sideways or something, and then I'll take it down. I won't, I won't uh, leave it up on my page. Before I got finished with it, it was like a two-minute two, sec, two minute, uh, video. Before I got finished, hi, Joanna. Before I got finished with it, I already had a, a like from one of my nieces, and then uh, one of my former co-workers at TVA had, had said, Hey, David, how are you doing? And, and man, it just lit up. I had like 30-something comments on that Facebook Live video, so I just I left it up. Uh, but I, it was a little bit of a promo for tonight, so maybe that will bring in some new people. Uh, it's always good to have people watching in with us, and so many people watch later after the 7 to 7.45. Uh, a couple of announcements. One is it was so good to do our, uh, our um, we weren't reopening because we never closed as a church, but we resumed our in-person worship this past Sunday. And that worked so well. Uh, worship was awesome. We had six worship services. It turns out we probably don't need those one o'clock services. At least we don't need them for now. So we're not going to be doing uh, doing those for now. But uh, the worship was really, really good. Um, and, and people who came, came prepared. They came wearing their masks. They brought their name written on a piece of paper. By the way, if you're coming this Sunday, that is so helpful. You can use an index card or the back of a business card. Uh, just It's the names of whoever's in your party, your family members, uh, and a contact number, phone number for you, and you drop that in a basket. As, uh, for the CDC. Um, and that's a requirement for the CDC because if someone tests positive for COVID-19, when they call, they're going to want to know who you were uh, uh, with at church. And... Uh, if you name people who are sitting around you, then we've got their phone numbers, and it makes it really easy, and it minimizes, not only it reaches the right people, but it minimizes the impact on others in worship um, who wouldn't be affected by it. Uh, our Summer Bible Challenge will kick off in, uh, in, in uh, July. That's going to be, actually starts on June 29th. And that's this Sunday. Uh, that's, this Sunday. that's this Monday, Becky's telling me. And on Sunday afternoon, you'll see a, a video. Dr. Kathy Baker has done a video to start us. It's going to be the four P's of the Bible, people, places, parables, and prayers. I'll be doing the second one, which is places, and then Kathy will do one, and then i do the last one. But uh, sometime Sunday afternoon, you can see that video on our website, and it'll just give you a preview. It's only like 30 minutes or less, and it'll give you a preview of, of what's coming up. Uh, there's the usual Bible devotion each day, but there's also Bible challenges for adults and kids and youth. So participate with us in that. By the way, if you're coming to worship this coming Sunday, um, know that the services to at 9:30, the gospel and contemporary 
And then at 1115, we are going to stick with that 1115. Uh, having it moved up 15 minutes from 11 o'clock gave us good time to get everything cleaned up and, and uh, change the rows that people sit in and all that. So that, that worked really well. Uh, let's get into our lesson tonight. Uh, all of that first stuff was free, no charge for that. Um, get ready to post your answers because I'm going to be asking questions tonight. And I'm going to try my best to, to wait uh, seven seconds to, to, uh, to give you time. To, it takes me seven seconds from the time I say a word until it reaches you. And uh, I'm always chomping at the bit to get going. Uh, last week in chapter 10, we saw Jesus leave Galilee where he had done most of his ministry. In fact, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus was always in Galilee until the Transfiguration, and then he began to move on this journey toward, uh, toward Jerusalem. Uh, here's the question. Why did Jesus go to Jerusalem? Uh, now, as you're, as you're going to be typing in your, your response, uh, Mark tells us that almost immediately after the, the Transfiguration, Jesus began his journey toward Jerusalem. He, he stopped off at Capernaum in Galilee, and then headed south, went across the Jordan River, down south to uh, Jericho, across the river. You cross the river before you come to Jericho. But why uh, is he going to Jerusalem? There's a very definite person purpose. Somebody said to worship at the temple. Yes, that's part of it. That's going to be the first thing that he does. But there's this is a very, very special trip to Jerusalem. Something else is going to happen there. Oh yeah, the Passover. It's a it's a huge celebration. We're going to talk more about what the Passover is about, but there's still more. This is a special Passover, a very special Holy Week. Oh yes, Joanna says it's time to finish his work. This, uh, if you read the Gospel of John, uh, fulfill his destiny. Somebody else is saying yes. If you read the Gospel of John. John tells us about three trips to Jerusalem. That's how we know that Jesus ministered for three years. At least that's why we think he did. But Mark hasn't told us about those other trips to Jerusalem. He's, he's concentrated on Jesus' ministry in Galilee. Now Mark tells us that, uh, that it's time for him to go to Jerusalem. Um, as he goes, there are apostles and disciples traveling with him. Jesus is leading the way. Mark told us that in chapter 10. It says the apostles were astonished. Uh, they are astonished because Jesus is, is really going through with this. He's told them three times that he's going to be crucified there. It says the other believers and followers of Jesus who were along with them were afraid. And that lets us know that they knew something bad was hap going to happen. Uh, they, they don't know if it's going to end with Jesus uh, or if they may be drawn into this as well. But there's a sense of fear and dread in their hearts. I want to quickly cover something right at the end of Mark chapter 10. For several weeks, I would do half of this chapter and half of the next chapter. Well, finally, I got to the end of a chapter, and I want to stick with that. Next week, we'll be doing chapter 12. But last week, I intentionally stopped just a little short of the end of, of Mark chapter 10. If you're looking at a Bible map, and I'm always telling people, hey, grab your grab your, your map. Uh, Annette Stout just joined us. Hi, Annette. And if you look at your map, you'll see uh, way down south, uh, where the Jordan River is almost to the Dead Sea, uh, Jesus would have been on the eastern side of the Jordan, and then he crossed over. And when he crossed over, he crossed at Jericho. Jericho is northeast of Jerusalem. So after Jesus passes through Jericho, he would head southwest and be on his way to that last leg of the journey through Bethany, Bethphage, a city or a village close by, and then into Jerusalem. Um, okay, this man calls out to Jesus as he goes by, with a particular title. This is right at the end of chapter 10. There's a blind man sitting along the edge of the road, and he calls out using a particular name for Jesus. And I want you to tell me what that name was. Jesus. And then he fills in a, a, a title for him. 
Um, Mark doesn't make any big deal over that at all. Martha Whitlock's watching here tonight. Um, other Gospels, there's one of the Gospels tells us that Jesus didn't particularly like that title that the man uses for him. Son of David. Thank you, Nancy. Jesus, Son of David. Mark doesn't, uh, doesn't, uh, Mark doesn't emphasize the fact that there was anything negative about that title or that Jesus perceived it in any way negatively. This, yes, Patricia, Jesus, Son of David. This is, this is, this man's way of saying, this is the Messiah. Remember, uh, Micah had prophesied, uh, other prophets had said that Jesus would come from the lineage of David. And this is this man's way of saying, this is the Christ, the Messiah. This man will not give up. He cries out. People say, shh, shh, be quiet. Don't, don't disturb him. And the man won't give up. He keeps crying out. What do you want, Jesus says. And the man requests that he be healed, and Jesus heals him, and then says, your faith has healed you. You might think it's odd uh, that Mark would throw this in. We're right at a point where we're, we are right to a climax, and yet Mark throws in this story of Jesus healing a blind man. Um, it's not there accidentally. It's, it's, sometimes it's good to stop and think, why would the gospel writer tell me about something like that? I think it's there. I don't know if you remember, but Jesus healed another blind man after, uh, and it took two steps. It's like he, he did a healing, and then he says, do you see? And the man said, yes, but people look like uh, trees walking around. So Jesus uh, finished the healing, and then the man could see perfectly. And we talked about how the apostles were only getting it halfway. Jesus has told them that he's about to be crucified, and yet they had a debate about which one of us is the greatest? When we get to your kingdom, James and John says, can one of us sit on the left and the other one on the right? I think Mark wants us to see this blind man has been totally healed. His faith has made him well. But the apostles are having trouble getting it. They are the closest people to Jesus, and they're quite not quite there in their faith development. They will be, but not yet. Becky, you're ready to read? Yeah. Okay, if you would do 11, 1 through 3. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, with no one, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. Okay, Jesus is about to do something here. We know what's about to unfold. This is really, really important. And this didn't just pop into his mind this morning as he's coming up from, from Jericho. By the way, when you go from Jericho to Jerusalem, as I said you go down to the southwest. Uh, it, that's like, I don't know the exact distance, but if I were going to Dalton, I'd say that's going south, so I'd say go down to Dalton, right? People always say up to Jerusalem. Even though you're going south, they view Jerusalem as uh, Mount Zion is there, but it's not, that, it's not that big a mountain. It's up because of the spiritual height, so people always go up to Jerusalem. Um, whenever Jesus gets to what's about to happen here. When Jesus sends for this colt, uh, he's made preparations. I, I, think he, uh, I think he had arranged ahead of time for this colt to be used. What's about to happen? In other words, uh, why is Jesus, why does he need this colt? What, what's, he, what's he going to use this for? What's, what's the big event that's going to happen whenever he, whenever he goes to Jerusalem? When he enters Jerusalem, I'll give you a hint. What's what's about to happen here? Yes, Nancy mentions a prophecy. We're going to read that here just in a minute. It's going to fulfill prophecy. Uh, he, he's, he's going to do his triumphal entry, and that was prophesied. We're going, to, we're going to read that just in a second. And whenever he does this, yeah, 
this triumphal entry into Jerusalem is going to, yeah, Nancy says it signifies who he is. He's no longer a triumphal entry. Thanks, Nelda. He's no longer going to be guarded or secretive about who he is. He's no longer saying, don't tell anybody who healed you. Don't tell anybody who I am. He's going to declare himself with this action, riding into town on this donkey or this colt, the foal of a donkey, as some gospel writers tell us. He's declaring himself the king. It's a very, very bold move. Um, uh, Mark will tell us something in chapter 14 we really need to know now. And somebody already said it. When I said, what's Jesus going into the Jerusalem for this time? Somebody said uh, the Passover. That was about to be celebrated in Jerusalem. The Passover was, uh, was probably the highest of the holy days. It was one of the feast times. The Passover was associated with something called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, there was also the Feast of Pentecost, and there was a Feast of Tabernacles or Booths uh, that took place in the fall. But uh, the, the, the Passover was a celebration, you know this probably, of the time way back when the children of Israel were in Egypt as slaves, and the last plague was the death angel visiting the homes of the Egyptians, and the Israelites were told to mark their doorposts with the blood of the lamb they had slaughtered that day, to eat the lamb hurriedly, to roast it, to be packed and ready to go, <coughs> and the death angel would pass over their homes. The death angel would take the oldest child, the oldest offspring, even of animals, of the Egyptians, but it would pass over the Israelites. That was kind of their first the first act of salvation, and they will celebrate that forever. Jewish people still today eat what's called the Seder meal or the Passover meal. <coughs> that feast, that celebration was taking place this week uh, coming up on, uh, <coughs> excuse me, on the day of preparation would be Friday and uh, of this coming week. The Feast of Unleavened Bread lasted all week, and it was associated with Passover. It was the time when, at the meal, when Jesus eats the Passover meal with the apostles. We'll see that in a, in a, a couple of chapters later. The bread will be unleavened bread that they eat. Um, now, what would it be like in Jerusalem during this Passover? Uh, first of all, thousands and thousands of people would do uh, pilgrimages from wherever they lived around the world to get into Jerusalem for this Passover. If you lived in Palestine, you tried to get there for every Passover. Uh, you would worship there. Uh, but then whenever, if you, if you lived, a, you know, a thousand miles away, you might only get there one time in your life. But every Jewish person dreamed about getting to worship at the temple and eat the Passover meal in Jerusalem. So the, the town would be, Nancy says, crowded. Absolutely. It's going to be filled with people, people who would come from all over the Mediterranean. Uh, the Roman governor lived up at a place called Caesarea. Uh, today it's sometimes referred to as Caesarea Maritime because it, to differentiate it from Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea is on the Mediterranean coast. It's north, way up uh, past uh, Jerusalem on the, on, the, on the coast, and that's where the Roman governor stayed. That's where most of his soldiers were. But in, at the time of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, if there was ever going to be a revolt, if there was ever going to be a rebellion by the Jewish people who wanted to be free from Roman rule, that's when it would happen because so many people would be in Jerusalem. So the Roman governor would always go down from Caesarea to Jerusalem. He had a palace there. He had a, a, a huge uh, place where he kept his soldiers. It was in that place where he kept the soldiers that Jesus was, uh, was mocked and sped upon and the robe was put on and the crown of thorns. So he'd bring all these soldiers with him so that he could keep the peace. Uh, 
everyone, there would be a sense of excitement and tension on this particular Passover. Especially there was excitement and tension because this rabbi, this teacher, this miracle worker, who a lot of people are saying is the Christ, the Messiah, is coming into town. And people know that. And some people would say there's going to be trouble. The Jewish leaders, the high priests, the chief priests, those people said there's going to be trouble. The Pharisees had been down and had tempted and tested Jesus. They're saying it's going to be trouble. The Roman governor probably sensed that. So just have that feeling about the city as we read on. Becky, if you would read 4 through 11. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered, as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna is the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Okay. Um, on this particular night, Jesus is not staying on the Mount of Olives. He's going to Bethany. Now, we call this particular entrance into Jerusalem something. What do we call this? I'm going to have to wait for you a minute so you can... Uh, so you can give them a response. Somebody already used this word uh, in answering what was about to happen. What do we call this entry and what do we call this day? Yes, today we call this Palm Sunday. Uh, in, in, in Christian churches everywhere, we celebrate this as Palm Sunday. Yes, Patricia, the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. Triumphal, uh, uh, triumphal is a, uh, th that came from a Roman tradition where a Roman general who had uh, defeated an enemy would come into town in a great triumph with a parade. This is Jesus' triumphal entry. But his entry was forecast by the prophets, as you all have already alluded to. The people are, uh, as, as Jesus rides into town, the people are doing some interesting things. They shout, Hosanna. And that is a Hebrew word that means, uh, in Hebrew it would sound more like Hoshana. It means save us. And it's something you would shout out to your king. We're being oppressed. We're under Roman rule. Save us. They were throwing their clothing on the ground in front of that colt. Uh, some of them had cut branches and were laying them on the road in front of the colt. Uh, by the way, uh, some gospels say palm branches. Today you see date palm trees in Jerusalem. In Jesus' time you didn't. Palm trees only grew in Jericho, which says people had to be... Uh, People had to be prepared for this. They went to Jericho, cut branches, and brought them back to Jerusalem so they could wave those. They are announcing the coming of the kingdom of David, the return of the kingdom of David, the greatest kingdom that ever had uh, existed in uh, the history of, of Israel. Uh, this is all part of a ceremony of uh, crowning a king. It's a coronation ceremony. The closest thing that we have today is in, I guess, is is in Britain when there's a new king or monarch. There's this, you know, long, long ceremony where the person is crowned with lots of traditional things. What they're doing 
is part of their ceremony for crowning a new king it's important to notice jesus attitude during all this he doesn't say no 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 don't don't put your coats on the ground no no don't don't wave palm branches i'm not the king instead he's prepared for this now he may have just through his power said i see a colt go get that colt and tell him that i need it i don't think that's the way it happened i think he had arranged this in advance i think the owner knew to have that colt tied up that morning and i think the owner knew when those apostles untied it and started to take it and said why are you doing that and they said uh our teacher needs it or however it was they phrased that i think they knew this was jesus so jesus had he is fully accepting supporting what's happening he is allowing himself not just allowing he is proclaiming himself the king uh, now listen to the scripture that had foretold this event jesus knew this scripture he's following it i'm going to read from zechariah 9 uh, verse 9 rejoice greatly daughter zion shout daughter jerusalem See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. When King David would enter a city, if he was there to conquer it, he rode a horse. But if he was there in peace, he rode a donkey. Uh, it was a symbol. Humble, yes, but it's more than that. It's also showing I come in peace as your king. Now, uh, Psalm 118 refers to this as well and i'm going to read that real quickly not all of psalm 118 uh, i use something in my bible it's a big old uh, see that big it looks like metal but it's actually plastic it's like a big binder clip and you put that in like on psalm 118 and you flip right to it uh, one sunday morning i had that in my bible and i walked up on the stage to read and uh when I, I was going to read from one of the minor prophets, Habakkuk or Nahum, or one of those that aren't just really easy to turn to, so I marked it with this clip, and when I opened my Bible up, that clip flipped out, and I remember Gary Bynum looked down and went, oops. <laughs> but I found uh, that, uh, that prophet, whoever it was, pretty quickly and, and recovered from it. But I, I had it marked to Psalm 118, starting with verse 25. Listen to how this also mirrors what's happened there lord save us hear that hosanna lord grant us success blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord from the house of the lord we bless you the lord is god and he has made his light shine on us with boughs in hand branches palm branches join the festal the festival the celebration procession up to the horns of the altar Okay, David is talking about a, a celebration, more than likely, where he was being made king. And it says that when it says going to the horns of the altar, for Jesus, that means going to the temple. Because that's where the altar was. Um, now, um, <clears throat> Becky, did you read the part about them coming to a fig tree? You no, didn't, did you? Yeah. All right, we're going to read some more. But next yeah. morning... That was, uh, that was a Sunday. What Becky did read says Jesus came into the city. He got off that donkey. He went into the temple. He walked around. They left and went to Bethany. The next morning, Monday, they're coming back. They see a fig tree. And Jesus went to see if he could get some figs. He was hungry. By the way, when we were in Israel, several times we were able to eat figs, ripe figs. Awesome. It's like having a fig newton without the newton. They were, they were good. When he found no figs on the tree, he said, May you never have fruit on you again. And then he went on to the temple. We're going to read that part in a minute. But the next morning, Tuesday, when they came back along the way, they came to that fig tree. Does anybody remember what had happened to the fig tree? In other words, on, on Monday morning when he came up and saw this fig tree, leaves on it, it looks like it's, you know, everything's healthy and well. Jesus basically cursed it and said, okay, may you never have, you don't have any figs on you now, may you never have figs on you again. The next morning, 
they come along. What's happened to the fig tree? Oh, yes, it was dead. It was withered instantly. This trig fit said trig fig tree was withered all the way to the roots. This is one of the most confusing stories in the New Testament. Uh, what makes it more confusing is that Mark tells us it was not the time for figs. You know, it's uh, it, it, they weren't in season. It's too early. So we read that and we say, well, that's not fair. Why did he curse the tree for not having figs on it? Um, what might be the lesson in that for us? I, I think there's a definite lesson, but I, we're going to have to read a little bit more scripture. What, what do you think might be the lesson? Jesus comes along, he sees a tree, fig tree, he's hungry, he goes over to get some figs, there's none on it. And he says, okay, may you never have figs again. And the next morning, they walk up and boom, it's withered all the way to the ground. Withered, you can imagine. The leaves were yellow, maybe falling off. It, 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 was, it was dead or dying. So what, what might be a, a point for us in this? By the way, a lot of scholars say that this is not so much a spoken parable as an acted parable. It was one of those things that Jesus did, and then we're supposed to glean the meaning from it more than from what Jesus said. Any guesses as to what uh, what this may mean? I don't see a lot of, lot of responses just yet. It's very likely that this fig tree represents the children of Israel. The Jewish people, they have, they should have been bearing fruit. They should have been accepting, receiving, and giving off the good news to other people. But instead, some have. His disciples, his apostles, they've responded. They're bearing fruit. But most of the Jewish people are not. And this thing about it's not time for the fig tree to be in, in season or bearing fruit yet, uh, uh, yes, there you go. If you're not uh, fruitful in your life, you're you're dead spiritually. That's that's very much a part of this. Uh, and and Jesus is saying, I may have come early. You didn't expect me. I've come in a way that's different from the way you expected me to come. But you should have responded to me. May you not ever bear fruit as a result. Uh, Becky, if you would read the rest of the fig story, 22 through 26, and we're going to come back. To the temple because it's like Jesus went to the temple on on Monday after he cursed the fig tree now we've jumped ahead to Tuesday morning but I want to finish that up 22 through 26 have faith in God Jesus answered truly I tell you if anyone <laughs> says to this mountain go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in <coughs> their heart but believes that what they say will happen it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. When Jesus' disciples noticed the fig, the, this fig tree was all withered, and they're, they're surprised by it. It's like, oh my goodness, what happened here? Jesus doesn't talk much more about a fig tree. He goes and says, listen, here's the lesson. Have faith when you pray. He's wanting us to bear fruit. That withered tree, somebody said it, it's like being spiritually dead. If you don't bear fruit, you're of no use to the kingdom. Yes, that's right. And Jesus is saying, don't be like that withered tree. Pray, and when you pray, believe that your prayers will be answered. Uh, this is the lesson that Jesus had taught when he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration and a father was there. His, his, uh, his little boy was uh, uh, having convulsions and, and the, the apostles couldn't heal him. And the man said something to the effect that, uh, would you heal him if you can? And, and it's like Jesus is saying, that's no way to pray. It's no way to talk to God. Don't, don't say if. Of course I can do it. 
do you believe? And the man said, of course, yes, I believe. Help my unbelief. That's a good lesson for all of us. Pray believing. And sometimes i got to admit I pray thinking this is impossible, but I'm going to ask anyhow. It's always possible with God. When we pray, think about any grudges that we may have and and take care of the of the gap that we have with our brother or sister. Forgive that person, Jesus said, and that opens our heart to receive God's forgiveness. This is not a this is not a new teaching for Jesus. He's already taught us the Lord's prayer, and in that Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We might use debts for those who sin against us. Whatever the word, what it's saying is, forgive me as much as I forgive those who've hurt me or sinned against me. Now, I skipped over the part of Jesus going to the temple because I wanted to get the fig tree and the teaching that came after the fig tree together. But, Becky, we're going to go back, if you would, to verses 15 through 19. Because here's what happens when Jesus got to the temple on Monday. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus was driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written... My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. Okay. Um. Think about what it was that Jesus was um, reacting to in the temple. In fact, give me some comments here. What, what upset Jesus so much about what was happening in the temple? And by the way, his behavior in the temple is so different from what we have come to expect when we read about his ministry in Galilee. Um, in 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 this scene here, Jesus becomes very angry. Uh, we would call it righteous indignation. Uh, other Gospels tell us a little bit more detail about how he did what he did here in the temple. But Jesus is reacting against some bad things that are happening in the temple. What, what is it that makes him so upset? What are the things that he's... That he's uh, okay... Um, things are happening in the temple that shouldn't be happening. Yes, thank you. Um, the money changers, uh, they, were, they were there for a good reason. Um, they were, yes, somebody says they were cheating the people. Nikki, thank you. The money changers were there. It's like whenever we went to Israel... Um, I did something stupid. I exchanged some dollars at the airport into shekels. Shouldn't have done that. Bad exchange rate. It was kind of nice to have shekels immediately because we ran into some place where we needed a few shekels, and I, I had them. But, oh, my goodness, you got a lot better exchange rate when you when you got to the hotel or, or at another place. And so at the other place, I exchanged more U.S. dollars and got my shekels. But... Uh, in the temple court, there were money changers that were there to do a very good thing. You could only put money in the offering plate if it was uh, temple currency. And so people would come with Roman coins. Most of them would have been Roman, but it could have been Greek. It could have been whatever country they, rep they came from. And the money changers were there just to provide a service. You come with $20.00. By the way, you can put any kind of denomination you want in that offering box at Christ Church. We'll take care of getting the exchange done. But uh, in their tradition, you couldn't put any money in other than temple currency. So the money changers would take your money. They would give you a good, fair exchange rate. That was the idea. If it was worth $20, you got $20. But over a period of time, 
they had started charging exorbitant rates like they were doing kind of at the airport in tel aviv for the exchange bless you and so they're cheating people somebody said that in their comments people were being cheated absolutely they were there were people selling animals of sacrifice that also started out to be a wonderful service somebody traveled all the way from cairo you couldn't take a lamb with you that far so you bought a lamb there now they were rejecting people's animals and selling them at a ridiculously high price for profit jesus cleansed all that in fact said you can't carry anything across the temple courts effectively what jesus did when he cleansed the temple was he shut down temple worship he shut down animal sacrifice you couldn't carry an animal now on that day jesus said stop you can't carry anything across these courts because it's a house of prayer uh, he shut down their worship uh, he has really upset people the high priests all the authorities at the temple would be upset because he's interrupted the flow of their worship but also he's hit them in the pocketbook because all those money changers all those people selling animals paid a commission this is sad but they paid a commission back to the high priests the chief priests and in fact some of that was being done by people working for the high priest so you can hurt people politically you can hurt people religiously but when you hurt people economically uh, it gets dangerous and Jesus has done all of those uh, Jesus is last week let me summarize real quickly here we're, we're, we've got about four more minutes on Sunday Jesus had entered Jerusalem uh, that's what we call Palm Sunday as you said on Monday he cleared the temple on Tuesday he and the apostles went back into Jerusalem and to the temple now we're going to pick up the story there Becky if you would read verse 27 through 33 they arrived again in Jerusalem and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts the chief priests the teachers of the law and the elders came to him by what authority are you doing these things they asked and who gave you the authority to do this? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, they feared the people, for everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. Jesus said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. You notice how he's in their face there? Um, they've asked him a question. Uh, keep in mind, Jesus has uh, he has no rank or status that will uh, give him the authority to come into the temple and do anything like this. As a Jew, he has a right to go through uh, one, two, three. He, he can go into the third court. He can pass through the court of Gentiles, into the court of women, into the court of Jewish men. Boom. That's as far as he can go. He's not a priest. He can't go into any of the inter sanctums and yet he has totally shut down worship for the day he's turned over the tables he's run out the money changers and so what do they ask they ask by what authority nancy says they're all indignant absolutely by what authority are you doing this who gave you the right that's the way we would say it who gave you the right to do this now that's a trap if jesus says well i have that right because of I'm Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, that says I'm acting on my own. He'll be arrested as a rebel. If he says I am God's son, and that's whose authority I'm using, that's blasphemy. So it's a trap, and he doesn't fall into it. He's much too wise for them. And so he says, I'll answer your question if you'll answer mine. Now, whose authority did John act 
and you saw there where they get their heads together i think it's kind of funny that they use almost always like a football team they go form a little huddle they talk among themselves and say we can't answer that can we if we say john uh acted on god's authority then he's going to say then why didn't you go out and and, and uh be baptized and, and receive forgiveness you didn't do that if we say john acted on his own he wasn't from god the people will tear us apart so we can't give an answer and so they said we can't answer and jesus said then neither can i see what i mean about being in their face uh, mark is so fast paced this has all moved along very quickly i caution you to st when you read mark it's almost like you need to read it twice you read it thinking about what he's saying read it about how he's saying it you think about what did he not tell us why would he move on like that without telling us some of that mark uh Mark, Mark is a, a beautiful gospel and uh, full of truth. Chapter 12 is full of teaching. And it, it's interesting that right in this last week of his life, in the next chapter that we're going to study, Jesus just teaches one lesson after the other. I looked at it today. I'll be preparing my lesson plan starting on it tomorrow. I doubt if we can get through chapter 12 next week. Read it all. We'll go as far as we can. But, uh, but then we... Uh, uh, we may split it in two and and uh, and just do half of chapter 12 next week. Well, we are out of time. I've enjoyed having people on here tonight. It's so good to see your names pop up as you're on here. And uh, I appreciate you watching. I know other people will be watching it later this week when it's when it's posted on our website. Good night. God bless you all.